Two doors or four doors? What's the difference? We'll find out this week on Motoring 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. You know, whether you're in Toronto or Estevan, Saskatchewan, there are times when traffic can be frustrating, especially when people are not following the rules. Well, this week we find ourselves in Rome, Italy, where there are no rules. It's every man and woman for himself. Although the unwritten rule may be just give way to the car beside you. In fact, they even give way to the pedestrians. And you know, it works. Traffic moves slowly, but it's moving and there are few accidents. It's all so civilized. Well, this week we're in Rome, Italy, because this is the spot that Mercedes has chosen to introduce their new coupe. And a coupe has two doors, right? Well, not anymore. The challenge was to create my own dream car. So, uh, we really uh, tried to make our design dreams come true. The dream was to uh, design a car that is a little bit away from the traditional Mercedes-Benz cars. And uh, we tried very hard uh, that the car gets more emotion, much more emotion. It was a blank sheet and we, we, we tried to find out how far can we go that, is, that it's still a Mercedes with all these traditional things as security and comfort and all these things, but uh, to bring it a little bit away from this rational face up to a, a more emotional direction. It's not possible to describe it with one word. I think it's a very extreme car maybe the most extreme car we have in our company and i think it's an absolute design statement we always uh, tried to find uh, details of the car which are well known by the customers so that the customer says oh yeah that's typical mercedes design but on the other way we made a wide step further into a new design direction I like the styling quite a bit. It's um, an, uh, an out of character styling for Mercedes because it's much more streamlined, less boxy. They've been going this way for quite some time, but it's a very radical departure nonetheless for them. Usually a coupe is a two-door car. And here we went one step further and uh, we say we are one generation ahead with this with this car because it's the first coupe with four doors they're just trying to make it sound like it's two doors it looks from the back like a two-door because of the roof line that's the only difference from a regular sedan i mean it's it's a sedan with say a silhouette of a coupe that's all it is in terms of volume, we're looking at approximately five to 600 units per year. So it's still a niche car, but nonetheless important volume. We will offer the CLS 500, the V8, uh, with 306 horsepower, and uh, as well as the CLS 55, and that will come mid-2005. I've been with the company for 15 years and I've seen unbelievable growth and um, development and new ideas. And I think the CLS is a tribute to how the company is changing, how forward thinking they are, how innovative. Uh, to design a four-door coupe, who would have ever thought? If you had to show one angle of the car to somebody, yeah. which, what's your favorite side view? Why? 
there in the side view you see these dramatic proportions of the car you see these overhang the front overhang the rear overhang you see this uh, dramatic uh, shoulder line and you see the flat roof with this beautiful coupe silhouette Definitely BMW shape some controversy specifically with the back end. Now you look at that car, the new CLS, I don't think you can see something controversial about it. BMW still has to worry about it and still they will use the rear, rear end in the 5 series and maybe even in the 3 series, who knows, uh, but they're sticking to it. With Mercedes, they have something lovely, just lovely. It's absolutely fantastic to see the car on the road. And, uh, you know, I, I know that car since some years and I still like it. So dreams do come true. The dream came true, yeah. And just like Martin Luther King Jr., I too have a dream. Or maybe it's a nightmare. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Since arriving in Canada with the eminently forgettable Cephia and Sportage, Kia's product offerings have slowly but surely got better and better. Well, this week on Test Drive, we take a look at the all-new Spectra 5, a vehicle that moves them slightly more upmarket and into a very competitive segment. The first thing that strikes you about the new five-door Spectra is its upscale appearance. It's a pretty package to be sure, one that also packs some substance. For example, it's powered by a 2.0-litre 4 that delivers 138 horsepower and 136 pound-feet of torque at 4,500 rpm. Given the Spectra 5's light 1,290 kilogram mass, this means lively performance across the board. From a standstill, it will chirp the tyres as it runs to a metric ton in 9 seconds, which by class standards is pretty quick. The 5-speed manual box and its well-spaced ratios also help the cause as they keep the engine well within the power band as you row your way through the gears. When you climb behind the wheel of the Spectra 5, you're in for a pleasant surprise. Primarily, nice materials that are butted together very nicely, comfortable seats, a ton of power options, nice gauges, effective climate controls, and a decent audio package that includes an MP3 player. However, there is a sore point as far as the driver is concerned, and it's right here, the shifter. Not only are the throws long, the gate itself is rather clunky. The bottom line, it's just not in keeping with the rest of the car. The Spectra rides on struts at all four corners and anti-roll bars at both ends. According to the glossy sales brochure, the suspension is also sport-tuned. Not. While the 5 did prove to be fairly predictable through the pylons, there is a lot of body roll. This in turn leads to noticeable understeer as speeds rise. Simply, the roll subjects the outside front tyre to larger than necessary loads, causing it to slide. While not a major concern, mainly because the compact car is not expected to handle like a speedster, slowing and ultimately limiting the roll rate would allow the nicely sized 205 50R16 Goodyear tyres to do a much better job. You know, at long last, Kia has added anti-lock brakes to this Spectra 5. However, and you knew there was something like this coming, in order to get the anti-lock brakes, you've also got to buy a sunroof. So why would you put a cosmetic item in with a safety feature? Couldn't be to pad the bottom line, could it? To illustrate the point, here's a list of the Spectra 5's key competitors, along with the price as equipped with anti-lock brakes. As you can see, the competition is pretty intense with some heavy hitters managing to undercut cost-conscious Kia. Quibbles aside, the system works very well, delivering short 34-meter stops from 80K. Likewise, the use of discs at all four corners, including vented ones up front, means the system also remains fade-free and responsive. One of the Spectra 5's biggest advantages is cargo capacity. Now with the seats in the upright position, this thing will swallow almost eight and a half cubic feet. Fold both halves of the rear seat flat and that number grows to almost 53 cubic feet, which is within spinning distance of most small SUVs. The bottom line, 
cargo capacity without compromise, which is why I'm such a huge fan of hatchbacks. Ironically, the Spectra 5 is actually 6.4 inches shorter than the sedan, yet it manages to put it to shame in terms of its flexibility and ability to carry cargo. On the safety front, the Spectra 5 comes very well equipped, featuring both front and seat-mounted side airbags, as well as seatbelt pretensioners. This new Spectra 5 is a decent set of wheels. It's got plenty of power, decent handling, nice comfort, and a ton of flexibility and cargo capacity. Indeed, it's a very well-rounded package. Perhaps the only uphill battle it faces is pricing. When you add the anti-lock brakes and sunroof to the base price, well, it moves the sticker up to the point where this car faces some serious competition. Our Midas tip of the week concerns brake warning lamps and low brake fluid level. There's a number of things that can bring a brake warning lamp on on the dashboard of your vehicle. Could be as simple as a low fluid level in the master cylinder, a leak in the hydraulic system, certain mechanical problems, or a major hydraulic failure in your brake system could all bring that light on on the dash. Sometimes more than one warning lamp on the dash. One of the first things you want to check if you've got a warning lamp on is the brake fluid level in the master cylinder. Make sure that it's topped up to the full level. As your brakes wear, they take fluid in from the master cylinder that fills up the cavity in the brake calipers and wheel cylinders, and that fluid that disappears from the master cylinder down to the wheels will leave a low level in the master cylinder and can bring the light on. In some vehicles, for example, Ford Windstars, the, the master cylinder only needs to be low by a very small quantity to bring the light on. So that's the first thing you check. Now, if there's a leak in the system, that could leave the master cylinder level low as well. So make sure you're checking it on a regular basis. If you suspect a leak, get the car in for repairs immediately. If it's just a little bit low on fluid as a result of wear, you can top it up and carry on. That's your Midas tip of the week. Since 88, when we started on the air and motoring, we've competed for the Midas Gold Cup, the uh, Soapbox Derby, and then the follow-up two weeks later, the go-kart race. And we just won it again in 2004. This is the sixth time over the years that we've won it. And it's lots of fun. It's an event for the Big Brothers that the Big Brothers put on, Big Brothers and Big Sisters. And you can see the fun that these guys have building the carts with the little brothers and the little sisters. Uh, and, and competing at High Park in the downhill portion of the race. It's, it's really fun. Uh, the paint schemes they come up with and the creative ways that they uh, engineer these, uh, these soapbox derby cars, it's really neat to see and they have a lot of fun. The weather usually cooperates and it's a great time. Go Bill Gardner, let's go! Of course it's always fun to win, sure, but uh, you know the main thing is competing and just having a good time with the other media people and, and getting the message out there to help the big brothers and big sisters and that's what it's all about helping them with their recruitment drive so anything we can do uh, to help them out we're glad to help out. I've got uh, three cars I've got uh, a 1938 Rolls-Royce Phantom 3, uh, 1972 Silver Shadow and a 1965 Plymouth Barracuda. Uh, my parents passed away a couple years ago and I was in a position where I was able to buy them from their estate and carry the flame, so to speak. Uh, you know, a lot of people think of Rolls-Royce as a, a symbol of success, which unfortunately, you know, due to the cost, that uh, is a sort of a requirement, uh, you know, for some people. But uh, I just like them because it's the right way to build a car. If you were set out and cost was no objective, uh, how would you do it? And I would like to think that uh, that's the right way that you could put it together. It's uh, 
pretty complicated engine in its day. It had hydraulic tappets and uh, V12, which was very popular. Cadillac had their V16s and Lincoln had 12 cylinder back then. Uh, aluminum crankcase, aluminum cylinder heads, twin spark ignition, about, about 170 horsepower, but uh, oodles of torque. Drives like a tank. A lot of uh, cars from this era, uh, especially Rolls Royces, they had picnic tables or, or bars in the back seat. This one uh, is a little bit different, probably because it was owned by a lady. Uh, has these lovely vanity cases in the back with a spot for a brush or some perfume or maybe some face powder. I don't know, they, uh, they aren't still with the car anymore. When I'm driving the car, I, uh, I'm just sort of thinking what this car was like when it was brand new and I'm always amazed how well this car performs uh, even today. Uh, the brakes are great and the power is really fantastic. It can keep up on highway speeds, no problem. And, and having driven a lot of cars from this era uh, makes me appreciate even more how really you know, state-of-the-art this car was in its day. It, I think it'll outperform just about anything from this era. You know, there are over three million people that live in the city of Rome, and sometimes you would think that every single person owns a car, but those who don't own a car own a scooter. They are simply everywhere. And you know, I know our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner, if you ever came here to Rome and he had to decide between renting a car and renting a scooter, I know what his decision would be. How about it, Bill? Well, Brad, when in Rome, do as the Romans, right? So I'd be taking the two-wheeled scooter, that's for sure. I can remember when my parents first retired and spent the winter in Florida. I had a 750 Honda motorcycle at the time, pretty fast bike, biggest one that they made at the time. And I remember my mom and dad buying these little Honda scooters, they were called an Express, and I just kind of scoffed at them at first. But when I went down there, you know who was riding those scooters up and down the beach? It was me. Just don't tell anybody about it. Anyhow, we want to talk this week about uh, rust proofing and corrosion inhibitors. I guess more importantly, nothing is rust proofed. If you're around enough humidity, road salt, and enough years, sooner or later you're going to get rust on a vehicle. So they carefully call it corrosion inhibitors. And a lot of people want to know should they get it installed at the dealer? Uh, should they put rust proofing or corrosion inhibitors on their vehicle at all? Dealer installed, aftermarket, whatever. Basically, here's how it goes. If you're in Western Canada, you don't have as much of a corrosion problem as we have in Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes. In lots of cases, you don't need any extra rust protection. I notice what, when I'm in uh, the prairies, and especially in British Columbia, I see vehicles from the 70s and 80s that are in mint condition with no extra rust protection at all. It just seems to be that the weather is much better out there and less road salt, etc. They last longer. If you're in the salt belt, though, Maritimes, Quebec, Ontario, it's a real good idea to think about some extra rust protection, especially if you want to keep that vehicle more than about five years. Now, it depends on the type of vehicle as well. Now, the domestic cars and trucks are much better in terms of inhibiting corrosion by their very nature. The, the way they do their paint jobs, the type of metal that they use, two-sided galvanized panels, multi-stage paint processes, they're much better. The import cars, even the ones that are built here in North America, are not as good in terms of corrosion protection they're also made of lighter gauge steel so once the rust starts on there they perforate a lot quicker because they're thinner so you you know use your own discretion here but if you want to keep that vehicle for a number of years some extra rust protection is better than nothing at all now we could stand here all day and debate whose system is better than another uh, I think probably the best systems are the ones that don't drip a whole lot because you know it's awful messy to have a vehicle with that light runny stuff that drips all over your driveway or all over your garage although the runny stuff seems to penetrate the crevices better at the bottom of the doors so I guess you could have the best of both worlds by having the thicker uh, material applied maybe at the dealer or when the car is fairly new and then every few years touching it up with some of the runnier stuff which you can actually buy in an aerosol can at an auto parts store spray it into some of those vents along the bottom of the doors the bottom of the trunk lid all the areas that are most likely to get corrosion and that way you'll have the best chance of defending against rust till next week I'm Bill Gardner for motoring 2005 
the stupidest example of political correctness has to be a boxing match between a guy like George Shuvalo and a guy like Muhammad Ali. And the TV commentators say, Shuvalo's the one in the blue trunks, Ali's the one in the red trunks. Like, that's the biggest visual difference between these two boxers? The second stupidest example has to be a recent court case in Toronto where some hotshot law student got his client off a no left turn charge because the sign wasn't printed in French. Hello! If you're going to have different languages on signs in Toronto, it ought to be Italian or Chinese, not French. Besides, if you go to Quebec, you won't see English on the signs down there because it's against the law. Now, I am not one of these guys in Belleville who stomps on the Quebec flag. I speak French, my kids speak French. I'm proud and happy of the fact that Quebec is a part of our country. But traffic safety is too important to let political correctness get in the way. Now, to the credit of the city of Toronto, the mayor told his lawyers, I don't care what language the signs are in, if you break the law, you're paying the price. Besides, if you can't understand an arrow with a line through it, go back to school. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, BMW took a lot of criticism when it redesigned its 7 Series. The traditionalists just didn't like the new style. Well, the new Mercedes CLS Coupe is certainly a brand new look for the company, but you know, I don't think Mercedes has anything to worry about. I know that design is subjective, but I just personally love the new styling. And you know, it's even turning heads here in Rome, the eternal city, where there are so many other things to look at. And that is saying something. Graham will have a much closer look at the new CLS on a future test drive. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. You know that eight of the ten most polluted cities in the world are in China. And we all know that China's automotive industry is exploding. So uh, China is at that unbelievable crossroads that says how can we be more environmentally friendly? And the decision that China makes today and tomorrow is going to impact air and water quality for all of us all over the world. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that.